Dr. Balesh Jindal is a medical practitioner with 40 years of experience. She is also an accomplished author and a painter. Her latest book, The Reluctant Doctor, is an honest and vulnerable chronicle of her experience as a doctor practicing in a remote village for four decades. She also authored A Hundred Dreams, a coffee table book, which includes a hundred verses. Her essay, The Day of Compassion, was selected for the Award of Compassion by Stratford University. Dr. Balish is also a professional artist and her artworks adorn the walls of art collectors in India and abroad. Hello and welcome to Chaibri. Today we have with us doctor, painter and author Dr. Balish Jindal. Welcome Dr. Balish Jindal to Chaibri. It's lovely to have you and listen to your life stories. Thank you for having me here. I'm very happy to be here. So, Dr. Balish, you are a medical practitioner for many, many years, almost 40 years, and you are an acclaimed author. You have published three books. You are a painter, and uh, you consider all these facets of your life to be an integral part of who you are, your persona. So, give us an idea how this all of this came about. So, well, that's a long answer, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> it's too complicated. Uh, the thing is, I feel all these facets of mind, which people think, they are too many. Actually, they're not too many because it's a part of my personality. Like if I were not a doctor for so many years, I wouldn't have been a good writer or a good artist or a poet or a photographer. Mm -hmm. I think it came from my being a doctor mm -hmm. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. If I were not a creative person right from the beginning, I couldn't have been a good doctor, I think. Wow. So everything added to each other. That's what I think. Wow. So, you always wanted to be a doctor. Take us to your early parts of your life. And okay, I wanted to be a doctor, yes. And it happened very naturally. I didn't have to struggle. I think I was just lucky, I think. I was destined to be a doctor. So, things came too easy to me, I think. I didn't have to struggle. And the part where the reluctance comes in, my book is titled The Reluctant Doctor. So, the part where it is when I graduated, I was 24 and a half. Okay. And I got married that around that time. Okay. So then my husband already left for England as soon as we got married. Mm -hmm. And he wanted, he came back to take me with him. You know? He was in the same profession? He's uh, a, my husband is a surgeon. surgeon. Okay. Now he's a liver transplant surgeon. Okay. So he, we always planned to go abroad, both of us. That was a, that, like most doctors in India. Right. We wanted to go abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, then my father had bought this farm in Kapaseda, which is in the suburbs of Delhi. Mm -hmm. Right. So, since my husband was trying to settle himself in London right. and I didn't appear for any of the post-grad exams here, I thought I'll just go and uh, become a pediatrician there. That right. was my dream. Mm -hmm. So, my father says, okay, about this farm and my neighbor is falling sick. He's saying, till you don't decide what you want to do with your life, mm -hmm. why don't you come with me? My neighbor keeps falling, treat them. I okay. said, I don't know how to treat fevers. They didn't teach us that. <laughs> so, I mean, they just teach you all books. You right. don't know how to see patients. You were fresh out of fresh uh, out of college, college, yes. So he says, "What did they teach you for six years? Then even I can treat a fever." Right. So he said, "Come with me." I said, "Fine. Let me humor him. Doesn't matter." Uh -huh. I went with him. So he had five, six people. They came running. He said, "Come, come. A doctor has come." So he was very proud to take me there. And I went there, and there's one guy called Babu Ram. He's become a legend now hmm. because if Babu Ram had not got okay, I would have gone to London. <laughs> oh, okay. So very, very important yes, person. He's an important character person. In your story. Yeah. So Babu Ram came and my father said he's got fever. He's going to some quacks here. Hmm. And uh, I said, okay, I need to do your blood investigation. I need your chest x-ray. They all looked at me. They said, what are you talking? What's all this? You just treat him like that, just like that. I said, okay. So I said, okay, typhoid. I think it's typhoid. So there are no chemists there. There was no doctor there. So my dad this said, you're okay, talking about 30, this is 1983. Back. 1983. Wow. Yes. Okay. There was nothing there. Mm, 40 years and uh, so my father said, okay, you write the medicines, I buy them. He was very passionate about the whole thing. He got the medicines next morning again, he's at my house. Hmm. And he says, I have four more patients. I said, fine. So I saw those, those guys also became better than before. Right. I don't know how. And then every day he would come. For weeks this continued. And then one day I see my mom is also sitting in the car okay. when they came. I wondered why she's sitting there. So then I don't know, I kept wondering and I tried to keep looking very 
frustrated and angry and everything. I thought he'll understand I don't want to go there. Mm. Imagine a village, it was a, now it's National Highway 8. Right. Those days it was a proper village nowhere. road winding, you know, all Kacha road and mm. everything. So we went there and there when we so went there, there was a huge board, Dr. Balish Jandal, huge, really okay. huge. And I was so ashamed of myself and I couldn't even look at the board. I cringed. I said, what is this? He said, nothing, you come in. Ah. So I went in and there was a Pandaji, there's a puja going on. Inauguration of I your said, what is cabinet. that for? I wondered. I was too simple, you know. And I thought maybe he is doing puja for the farm. And there were some Bithai boxes lying there. Yeah. And I said, the patient, these people have come mm. for. Right. And it was, you wouldn't believe while we were doing the puja, he'd got the benches all around the room. Right. Already I had 20 people sitting all around, villagers, 20 villagers. Waiting to be yes. seen by you. That time I thought they'd come for the sweets. But they're actually <laughs> patients. Yeah. Oh. Because the boat is there, they thought doctor hai to chale right. jao. So by the time the puja finished, everybody, I also made my way towards the car. I said, chalo ghar. Hmm. He said, no, what house? He's saying, you have to see them. See these patients. I said, why? He said, they are patients. I hadn't ever thought my patients. It was a new concept for me, hmm. you know. Hmm. And so he said, they go. So I sat, there was a table there and I saw the patients and then I kind of connected with them at that level too. Mm. Though I was very reluctant, I was resentful. I said, that's not for me. I couldn't even touch their pulse because they were sweaty. Okay. I didn't want to touch them also. I was that. You were all by yourself. Did you have any attendant? Or no, there? nobody. All by I was all alone. And my father said, I'll become your attendant, don't worry. Mm. And Baburam was there mm. to usher in patients. Okay. <laughs> so I had all the infrastructure. Uh -huh. So I saw them. So there were 20 and then by the time I finished, 10 more came. Mm. So my first day, I saw 30 patients. Wow. And all the medicines I had to write down and get, give them to them the next day. Because there's no chemist there. Right. So and next give day, them the medicines. Yes. The next day. He bought, my father bought. bought no it. charging, no money, nothing. He bought the medicines. And I gave it to them the next day. And they all became okay. Then next day came, next day, it just continued. I mean, days and weeks, and it became years, and then it became decades. Wow, this is a fascinating story, Dr. Jindal. I mean, I'm just thinking, what did go, what was in your mind at that time, and what made your father also make you do this? Because obviously he's seeing a benefit, a, a social benefit also in you being there. And you are obviously now looking at your uh, life in London that you're, you know, yeah. uh, looking forward to. How was it the initial years and uh, leading to your, you know, other creative interest also? We'll come to that. But how was it initially? I don't know. I think it was like my father, I have three brothers, but he used to pamper me a lot. Hmm. Maybe that was in his mind. That's why he pampered me. I don't know. I just had to say a word. There was nothing big enough which he would not get me. Hmm. I just had to say it, you know. Right. He would get me a car, he would get me anything. Huh. And then he... It's a very dainty father-daughter relationship. Yeah. It's totally him and me, that's it, you know. Hmm. And my mother just agreed to everything he said. Like, right. So, he kept telling me all the time, he would keep saying, don't let anybody go back for lack of money. Hmm. Treat them. Hmm. He kept saying that to me every single day. Hmm. Don't let any patient go back from your clinic hmm. without medicine. Hmm. Don't let money come in between. And that thing stuck in my mind. Hmm. And I worked on that principle, you know, always. Even if somebody couldn't afford it, I said, doesn't matter. Let them come in. Let hmm. them come in. Wow. So I think that helped me a lot. So you mentioned somewhere that you crossed the economic divide. And uh, that was a different Hindustan and, yes. you know, and you were from a different India. How was that experience and give us that some was traumatic. ideas? It was traumatic. It was traumatic. Obviously, like you've grown up for 24 years. I was a very urban, modern girl. Mm. I was studying to be a doctor, but I was fond of parties. I was fond of social life, social friends, circles. restaurants, dancing, everything. Mm. I was a typical South, South Delhi girl, you know. Mm. And then suddenly I'm there in a village. Yeah. So for many years, I was ashamed to tell my friends where I was working. Mm. I was ashamed of myself. I was ashamed of my profession. I was ashamed of everything. And I suddenly fell down from even my friends. Like some people stopped talking to me. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because I became Just, too low for them. Wow. That makes you really wonder, right? How superficial. And then I, the me. worst thing was I had to change my clothes too. When like, you're going there. In yes, spite like patients up. were coming, but there were many I could see from my table. Yeah. They were peeping in and going out. They Just weren't coming in. 
they weren't coming in. They would peep and see a girl, chat of a girl sitting there. They would leave. They would not be comfortable. They wouldn't. They okay, weren't. Okay. So I asked one patient, I said, what's the problem? He said, this is the problem. I said, what? He said, you're wearing pants and shirt. Hmm. So I said, that hit a chord somewhere. Hmm. And next day I went and bought a lot of khadi saris. And I bought long, thick cotton blouses. Right. And I tied up my hair in a bun. Huh. And I, was 10, I looked 10 years older. So I was happy with that. Then they came in. And the thing is, these villagers, they were touching my feet. I was just 25. Hmm. People who are old, Aap to humari maa ho, aap to humare bhagwaan ho. Because doctor is gone. I then, have yes. to look the part, you know. Yeah, correct. It was some, something like guide, you know, where greatness is thrust upon you. Right. At times you feel like an imposter. Am I fit for this? You question yourself. Right, yeah. So what was that turning point when you felt that the reluctance or, uh, you know, the resentment that you had uh, slowly was going away and uh, you were actually adding value to others and to your life. When did you feel that? This came gradually, like the first 10 years, yes, I was very reluctant. Mm -hmm. I stopped meeting my friends because all my colleagues, you see, they were working in very big and fancy hospitals. Mm -hmm. Half of them go abroad, as you know, doctors leave India, right. they don't work here right. and nobody works in a village. Mm -hmm. I was the only one. Mm -hmm. So they thought I'd really come down in life. And I kind of broke off with all my friends purposefully. There was no point meeting them. Did you find your purpose then by then you were feeling? No, purpose? not really. And then, but gradually, and just three years into my practice, my okay. father died in a road accident. Oh. So I was oh. left on my own completely with no support. That was and uh, so, but gradually what happened is like I've written in my book, like if one patient got okay, it was not one patient. They would have tractors, you know, these farmers all farming and mm all the hundreds of villages all around Kapaseya. They would all pile up in a tractor. And come to your clinic. Just for a visit. Some came just to socialize with me. Some came to sit in my sitting room. Yeah. And the whole tractor, which meant about 50, 60 people at a time, yeah. they would all come in and talk to me like I was a long lost friend or their relative, you know. Wow. Then I, I started know. connecting. I getting attached to them, feeling affection for them. I knew I was making a difference right at that time. You knew that? I knew that. I started realizing I'm changing their lives for the better. You probably were changing yourself also. Yeah. You did not and I was learning so much from them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we'll come to the, uh, the stories later on The Reluctant Doctor. But I wanted to uh, ask you the question on how did your creative instincts start coming in? Because uh, usually it always happens that when you go through a struggle or you go through something, um, painful, uh, that's the time the creative instincts are working to maximum True. and uh, you got into painting, you got into writing, I think I believe your first book was the coffee table book yes. or, or, or something else also before that poetry you had written book, yeah, a poetry book. So tell us about the creative outputs during this time while you were, um, you know, so called shoved in the other side of the world yeah. as a medical practitioner. Yeah. practitioner. See, I think that's why I said right in the beginning, if I were not a doctor, I wouldn't have become a poet or an artist or a writer. So as Satri says, that if there is no chaos inside you, mm. no star can be born. That's true. So there was so much resentment and chaos inside me. I was mm. not happy with myself. Mm -hmm. I was still regretting my life abroad. Mm -hmm. And this was an outlet then. So I was a creative person probably. So I started writing. Yes, I've been doing since school. I started writing. I started what were the first things you were writing? You were writing poems that time? Poems. Okay. I'm, I'm like naturally a poet. Okay. And uh, then artist, I started my art and I used to title my art hmm. with a poem. With a poem. So okay. I got an outlet for both my right. creative uh, instincts. So that was good. I don't title, I feel a single word for an art is not enough hmm. because too much feeling has gone inside it. Right, right. That's one. Right. And in my clinic, I didn't need a muse. Hmm. I saw myself looking too much at my patients, hmm. whether it's ethical or not. Hmm. But I was looking at their hair and the curl of the neck. I saw myself observing that. Yeah. And then I said, no, it's for the not that they were my muse, my patients. Hmm. Wow. My because head was full of them. You are dealing with human bodies. Yeah, so, yes. exactly. Hmm. So people tell me, why don't you do abstracts even now? Like, they, why don't I said, no, my head is full of faces. I have to yeah. paint them. Right. I can't do anything besides faces. Right. So you also commented some time back that uh, if you were not a doctor, you wouldn't have been this creative uh, 
Uh, and you also said that if you were not these, this creative person, you wouldn't have been a good doctor. So why is that? Why, why do you feel okay. that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the thing is, I feel if I were not creative, there are many doctors, there are, everybody I'm sure is a very, very good doctor. Most of the doctors around, especially with 40 years experience. But I was not only a doctor. Hmm. Because I had this thing about storytelling. Right. I would love to sit with them and listen to their stories. Right. I feel they were adding to my persona. Pers persona, yes. You know, and it didn't matter to me if I'm sitting for 20 minutes listening to that patient. Hmm. If I were not a good listener, I would not would have, have made a mark over there, I feel. Right. Right. And uh, as it's said, said in your profession that a good doctor treats the disease, but a great yeah. doctor treats the, treats exactly. the person. Exactly, exactly. So, so that helped you look yes. at the person. Yes. Okay. So that is when they come, they say, Hum to aapke clinic mein step karte, ho jate. Right. because they can talk their heart out with right. Yes. And doctors would say, it's so boring. Like my husband is a surgeon. So he says, emotions and medicine don't come together. I right. said, but that's my job. Yes. I just, my 90% of my medicine is psychology and counseling. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Balish, tell us about uh, your journey of painting and how did you come about it? And you mentioned a little bit about the muse. So Give us a little more idea. How was your journey as an artist? So, like I said, I was resentful in the clinic. I needed some outlet. Mm. So I started painting. I'm a self-taught artist. Mm. I had no idea about the rules of art, mm. what to break, what to keep. I had no idea. Mm. So I started experimenting. Mm. And gradually, I started painting with a knife. Okay. And I developed my own over the years. It's taken me a few years of laundering, of mm accidents of some were happy accidents so I learned hmm. and then I think I was very lucky so I painted I made a collection of about 40 50 pictures I had okay. in a separate room and then I think my husband got sick of the works <laughs> occupying a room sick of the works occupying so, the room yeah. occupying a room so he said why don't you take them to a gallery huh. I said I'm not an artist they'll throw me out huh. he said why don't you try it try out. it out yeah so I went to one housecast gallery there was one and that was my first gallery. I just took the works and she said, get ready for an interview next week and a show next week. Wow. I was so happy. Huh. And actually I sold two works in my first show. This was which year? This was 89, okay. 19 okay. maybe. Right. right in few years after you started your practice. So you, you started since then, you got into painting pretty fast. I mean, pretty soon yeah. in your life. Yeah. yeah. It's six years. Six right. years of being unhappy with myself. Frustration. <laughs> Frustration. <laughs> That's lovely. And then even trying took me time. Like even since the first show, I kept experimenting. Hmm. And I realized that what I could do with the knife, I was changing the concept. Hmm. Because everybody associates knife and palette hmm. knife with the bold thick strokes. Hmm. That's what everyone. Hmm. But Impasto. I have kind of, yeah, impasto. I have refined it to like, I pay paint only with the edge of the knife, the sharp okay. edge. Okay. And a kitchen knife. Not okay. a palette knife. Not a palette knife. Okay. So then they are finer and I get the depth. Huh. So that's my style I feel now, which I can own proudly. So your patience were your muse and a kitchen knife was your one of your muses. Yes. How wonderful. You still paint? You continue continue yes, painting throughout I paint your life? Every single day. That's like meditation and a prayer to me. Right. Every single day I paint. So after four decades, is the resentment still there? No, not at all. Not at all. Now I can hold my head high. Yeah. I'm not ashamed of myself. Uh, Why is that? Why is that? Something turned around? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Something very like a miracle happened with me. Okay. Which is not normal. It should not have happened. Hmm. So I saw an advertisement at Stanford University that you had to spend 24 hours in as compassionate way as possible. It's and a project. It was a project and write an essay about those 24 hours. hours. Okay. Okay. So I was seeing the advertisement. My daughter was about 20, 22. And she says, Mom, why don't you write an essay and apply for this? I said, well, what me, a small doctor in a small village, the whole world will be doing. Hmm. She's saying, isn't it your dream to go to Stanford? That right. was a prize, huh. a free oh, ticket to Stanford. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So she says, it's your dream, isn't it? I said, yes. But me, look at me. I, I won't do it. Huh. She said, no, you write. Whatever, whatever you write, huh. simple thing, do whatever you want to, but do it. Huh. So she really encouraged me. So what I did, there was a government school right next to my clinic. It has about four to five thousand students. Hmm. It's a very large school. Hmm. And they used to invite me for talks about the girls, adolescent issues and all. And then my patients too, 
I would I was getting a lot of uh, young girls who I knew from experience were abused, were abused. by people in the family. Hmm. That was a very common occurrence, which is coming now in the newspapers, you know, like after Nirbhaya, everybody is so sensitized towards rapes and sexual abuse. But I was seeing it right since 82. And it was not talked about that time, absolutely then, not. Yeah. So rape was always there, but journalism wasn't there. The news hmm. was not getting out. Right. But I was getting patients, too many patients actually. Hmm. Girls at young as two, two years, two years, one year. They were being abused and I knew it from side, they were abused. And uh, you did not have, must not have too much of agency to do something. I couldn't do, anything, couldn't do no. anything. At the most, if I call the grandmother or the mother to talk, they would always protect the male person who had, hmm. who was a perpetrator. So and in your mind, you knew that they all knew. I mean, they all knew. About they it. all knew because I was telling them. Right. But no action was taken. The girl would again be brought after three months or she has the same symptoms, you know. Right. So that was happening. Wow. So what I did when this essay I had to write hmm. in 24 hours, I went to the school, I talked to the principal, I said I need all the girls above 6th standard till 12th. Okay. I want them in a room, I want to give them a talk. She hmm. agreed. I didn't tell her what, what subject. subject, otherwise she wouldn't have let me enter, I know it. Hmm. So there were about 2000 girls in that room that, that day. Hmm. When I talked to them, I said all the teachers are out, right. I just want to be with the girls. And it was so surprising when each girl, when they knew they were alone with me, nobody could hear them. Every hand went up and I gave them the definition of sexual abuse. Every they hand, said yes, every, every hand, hand, almost 80%. Almost 80% of the percent Almost 80%. The went they went up, yes, doctor, hamare saath hua ye. By people close By to people them. close to them. And they were six standard above. I didn't even go in the junior, you know, because right. they are not so open. So I wrote this essay then about this, the whole experience I wrote it. Right. It was about, I would say, 1000 words maybe or 1500, I don't remember. So I sent the essay, nothing mm -hmm. happened. I forgot about it. And after two months, I get an email from this professor. He writes, your essay, Dr. Jindal, is heads above the rest of the essays in the world. Wow. I couldn't believe it. That's such and amazing. you're invited to Stanford and the tickets are paid for. I told my family about it. My son says, you keep clicking on the computer. You don't know computer, it's a scam. <laughs> Everybody in the family the said it's is. a scam. <laughs> like he said, nobody offers free tickets and not Stanford. So, but my husband believed me. He said, we'll go. Huh. He said, even if the tickets are not refunded, that's not important. We'll go, we'll have a holiday. Huh. It's fine. Yes. So we went there. How was that experience? And that was like when I went there, all the senior professors in Stanford, they walked towards me. They said, Dr. Jindal, they hugged me. And they said, when we read your essay, we all were crying, all of us. Mm. That's how it affected them. Mm. Then in their office, they had a portrait of me. Somebody had drawn a portrait of me in their office. I mean, that was my turning point. I said, this is a miracle. I mean, this is a miracle. in a small clinic, small village. And this was your destiny. Yeah, this, this was my... Probably. So many years back, you... I got validation. I felt I was not an imposter. And if you were not working in that that background, in that area, socio-economic setup, you would have never known about Exactly. This. Like the way it is news to me, yeah. that 80% is a very high number. Yeah. And uh, it's absolutely shocking True. for me to also absorb this True. information. I, I want to like touch upon the issue also, since you brought it up. And So what in your, according to you, is the solution to this. I can't believe that the people who are supposed to know do not know about it. You know, people in power or something cannot. What can be done? What is your honest opinion of how can one um, See, save, the thing our is, children, save our girl, children? I mean, save our children for that matter. Why would I restrict it to girls in that case also? <laughs> See, the thing is, I started in 82. It's 40 years now. Hmm. In 40 years, I haven't seen a change. Seen at a change. All. If in 40 years it's not changed, the patriarchal system in India will take another thousand years to change. It will not go away anywhere. You have seen it up and close enough to yes, say this. Yes, I can say that. Mm. It's not going to change. And the thing is, it's not only the, that's the worst thing, is people say, you know, when you meet them at parties, oh, tell these villagers, they must be doing. But the worst thing is, it's happening more in the modern urban world. Educated people. Educated people? Yes. Then did you do something similar in, in, a, in an urban setup? 
Yeah, I did. I went to a South Delhi school because actually I had got some money which I had to donate to a school from Stanford. Okay. So okay. I donated it for this cause to this school. So I went there and I, I told the teacher, she said, no, we have a counselor. We don't need you. Our hmm. children are all okay. Hmm. So hmm. I said, it doesn't matter. Just give me an hour with your children. So when I closed the room and I did the same thing, I closed the windows, I closed the room and there was pin drop silence. And when I gave them the definition of sexual abuse, hmm. which can be even something which is a wrong touch, just a feeling you get, that's sexual abuse. Right. Almost everyone, so many girls, though this was a urban school, they said, ma'am, I would like to talk to you separately. Hmm. There were so many children, so many boys. It, it was happening with boys. I said, you have a counselor, why don't you go to her? They said, never. I said, why not? They said, it will go around the whole school if you go to the counselor. Right. I said, then do you tell your parents if something like that happens? No. I said, why? They will not believe us. They will think we are at fault. So hmm. two reasons. Then I said, what do you do? They all phone a friend. Okay. <laughs> so right. I said, okay. So I told the principal about this. She was very shocked. So I said, let's do one thing. These are sensible children. So let's put up a letterbox with the lock and give them passwords. So the children don't write their name and they put in uh, letters what their problem is. Whenever you have four or five, just call me. I'll drop by the school. And I'll, she gave me a separate room where I could uh, counsel these children. So every four days, there were five people. Who, I was getting letters. I was counseling, solving their problems. And then one day the principal said the letterbox has been removed. I said, why? What happened? She says, the PTA, the parents, they said, no, this is not done. They were not comfortable. The with parents it. were not comfortable. They were not comfortable with it. That's wow. it. Wow, that's that's really an incredible. So that's how society will live that's, in. That's an incredible uh, experience of yours, and uh, of course, truly, as you said, that living in that kind of condition of practice that you were doing really made you compassionate, and you would not have known yes, about this, yeah. and probably wouldn't have had that courage and energy True. to deal with this. And talking about that, um, I, I would love to now come over to your uh, writings. And, uh, you know, uh, the, one of the books that I want to talk about is 100 Dreams, which is a very interesting concept of a coffee table book where uh, 100 verses and 100 benches. Um, how did this come about? Explain a little bit. And also would love to, love to hear a, a poem or two from okay. the book. Okay. So I was uh, taking pictures of these benches wherever we traveled. Mm. It was a very abstract idea. It was never in my mind I'll be able to manage a coffee table book. Yeah. So I, wherever I went, I would click benches. And I felt like these benches were kind of inviting me. And I felt they were, and they're all empty benches, if mm. you see. Mm. Almost all are empty benches. I felt a bench was a place where one can go. You're not judged. You're not questioned the whole world is just judging you, putting you in slots. Mm. A bench was a place where you can be yourself. Mm. I think that's why they attracted me. You could be broken, you could be a loser, you could have lost everything in life, but you could go Only and reclaim bench. that bench. Yes. That's what I thought. A non-judgmental place. Non-judgmental place where there's nobody. You can be alone, nobody will even ask you why you're alone. Right. So what a wonderful that's why. So I just concept. kept clicking then. And there was in my mind, I tell, kept telling my family, I want 100 cities and 100 benches. That was my goal I was striving towards. So then gradually I realized COVID happened. Then I realized I had exactly a hundred pictures. You did. Slightly more rather. Wow. So then I compiled this book and the poems also, they're not written hurriedly and they're not like any profound philosophy. They, they are slow poems written over years and they are just something about sometimes it's losing something, something a slow thought comes in your mind and you push it away. Why don't you listen to one of your poems in that case? <laughs> okay. Thank you. So this poem is something I really believe in. I feel believe in brokenness and mending again, which I think makes a thing more beautiful. Hmm. That shows in my art too, hmm. like the concept of Kintsugi, Kintsugi. where Japanese everything concept. broken is more beautiful. And since I've seen so many broken lives, as a doctor, hmm. so this poem is like that. So it's called, When You Meet Someone. When you meet someone, you meet his wounds, his joys, his heartbreaks. He comes with his aspirations as you do with yours. Measure your contentment 
to his agonies your betrayals to his acceptances your privileges to his miseries your laughters to his tears let the fronds touch and the magic shall begin so dr jindal lau i would love to talk about your book the reluctant doctor uh, it's a very interesting uh, title and i know by now why uh, what's the story behind it how did this book come about and uh, knowing the experiences that you 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 shared so how much of that is there is it a fiction is it uh, you know uh, real uh, experiences give us an idea about the book okay so reluctant doctor is not a biography mm. because very little is about me mm. it's more about the stories it's about like since it starts from 83 83 to 2023 it's a journey of 40 years. 40 years so it has in it how the country changed from like especially my area when in 1990 liberalization happened how that affected the general population i didn't read many newspapers i'm not a newspaper person hmm. so i would know what was happening in the country from the disease pattern of my patients how interesting so, so this like, is like when a socio economic commentary it's a it's a socio economic commentary how the country changed how money changes people right. how money changes disease patterns so it's a linear study of disease patterns hmm. okay and how crime happens when the farmlands were sold in 2000s the farmland prices skyrocketed mm. i don't know if you know about it mm. Mm. where the farmers became really rich mm. they had sackfuls of money lying in their back rooms mm. so then all alcoholism rapes murder suicides so much money brought in so much of uh, crime crime yes so this book is a story of all that the story wow. of a society basically story of the society yes and, uh, could we get, have a peek into it could you read us something yeah sure let me see what i want to read okay uh, okay so this piece i will read to you it's about how difficult it was for a single doctor a lady sitting in a village where along with reverence and adoration they can get aggressive and you can be i mean killed for it pro- hmm. probably hmm. so it's like there was this child who came to me one day he was brought in very um he had epilepsy and the epilepsy he had, he used to keep coming to me this child three year old child i think he used to keep coming the mother would get him she would not give him the regular medicines she just got him when he was getting an attack so every time i gave an injection he would get okay this had been going on for a year or two but she never gave the regular medicines so one day she comes and she brings him i give him injection usually he used to improve but he didn't i give him another as we were taught in kalavati i gave him another he didn't improve then he went into status epilepticus which is when the epilepsy becomes they become like very stiff stiff and it becomes beyond treatment so this is what happens and then we lost the child and so this is then the father came the father knew the wife was not taking care of the child so then this is and start from here he took the child in his arms and walked away quietly besides the crisis that ensued in my clinic that day another battle awaited me at home i had to recount the whole incident to my husband i was certain that being the disciplinarian he was for medical protocols he would find many faults in my line of action after listening to my narrative in detail he thought for a while and said it's not your fault i looked up in surprise and relief because he was my biggest litmus test he said you did what any good doctor would have done i could have cried in the comforting solace his words gave me but then he said i hope you realize that heroism does not work in real life he was always uh, against my heroism it was not heroism i always thought let me save this child if i can hmm. and i would do things instead of just it's easy to say oh take him to sartaje i would say let me do what i can and i know i saved many children but he called it heroism he thought i was being heroic got it so he said i hope you realize that heroism does not work in real life he said patiently for along with deification comes the risk of being attacked and vilified i heard his somber words and vowed to be more selective in my patients so i tried to save less you. patients then i learned yeah. right right so this book is really about you your entire life and i i'm sure it's it's very well received as i as i can see 
and it's such a commentary of the social, of the economic, and and your life itself. And I think you've put in a little bit of your life's pain and uh, despair and everything yeah. also into yes. it in a very lovely format. So it's lovely to read, uh, you know, uh, to hear a part of it. So you are so creative, Dr. Jindal, and I would like to know from you that what is creativity for you? What does it mean to you? I think creativity, I call myself an aesthetic person. Hmm. I feel creativity stems from that aesthetism. Hmm. I just like beauty in various things. Hmm. I like beauty in my clinic. Even a villager, a very poor lady, if she dresses up and puts a yellow ribbon and a red dupatta, I appreciate her. I tell her you're looking beautiful. Hmm. So I feel that's all a part of creativity. And I mean, life has, life is never perfect for anybody. Right. We can all make an effort to make it beautiful, hmm. little bits. Hmm. Hmm. And for me, this is creativity, my painting, my books. It's like meditation for me. Hmm. Once I paint, I don't feel the need to pray. Hmm. I don't feel the need to meditate. It just completes me. Living. It completes me. Yeah. Wow, lovely. So what do you think about this platform, Chaibrary? I think Chaibrary is a unique concept. And I have never come across anything like that that is happening in Delhi or anywhere else, in fact. Mm -hmm. And I've known Rakesh Ji for 20 years now, and he's come across to me as a very intense, very passionate person, passionate about his art, his work. And this is another facet of him. And I think this is a very positive point because so many people will get a platform on this. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best part of it. It's very gratifying. And thank you for the kind words. Thank you. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jindal. It was such a pleasure talking to you. And you had such an interesting life. And you had such an interesting life where you had an opportunity to give, to learn. And uh, we also in the process got to know so many things from you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you here. so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I hope you enjoy this episode of Chai Bready. And uh, we look forward to your continuous love and support. Do subscribe our channel and do press the bell icon for our latest update. This is Lubna Sen signing off for now. Until next time, please take care.